I can't believe people buy all this crap. I don't even think people play these things. I think they just take pictures of them and post them on r slash guitar pedals. Oh look, the 1981 Inventions DRV. It's the alternate dimension one. So cool. I can't wait to see what they come up with next. Can't wait to see what cool new decal they put on it. Wow, these are cooler than Funko Pops. You know, maybe I should get a midnight edition dig to go along with it. I could just take my old pink dig and throw it in the trash. What the fuck are you? I'm sloppy sock. All right, whatever. You wanna buy all this crap? Rhett Scholl told me that I need to replace all my dirt pedals with DS1s so that I can stop noodling. I think he has my best interests at heart, but I don't know, I won't really know for sure until I take his $80 tone course. Rhett Scholl is a sellout. Have you forgotten why you do this, Shootique? You're here to show people music gear that actually helps them play and produce music, not help them collect guitar pedals like their Beanie Babies. You're right, Sloppy Sock. I got caught up in being a mindless consumer bitch and forgot that music is about embracing your passion and creating something beautiful to share with the world. Sloppy, I need you to help me find something that we can share with the folks at home. Something that'll actually help them create better music. Something they could build with their own two hands to save money and give them a sense of pride and accomplishment. Oh shoot, Teak, you big dummy. What about that? Hot dang, Sloppy. That's perfect. Hi, my name's Shootique and I'm in a mania. Talking about consumer guitar pedals is entry level trash. So today I'm gonna be talking about this, the Hairball Audio 1176 Rev A Compressor. This is a DIY clone of the UREI 1176 Rev A Compressor. You can tell that it's the Rev A because of this beautiful blue stripe. The Rev A is special among 1176s. It's not particularly transparent and it can add a lot of character to your signal. The unit is mono with an optional stereo link should you choose to build two and run them together. In this video diary, we're gonna look at the different 1176 revisions, take a look at the controls on the unit, and then we're gonna run the compressor on a few different sources. After that, we're gonna take a look at my build notes and finally, I'll wrap it up with my thoughts on the unit. 1176s come in a few different revisions and Hairball offers three different kits that cover most flavors. The Rev A is the original. The signal and line amp of this unit are based on the 1108 mic pre and use a FET as the first active component in each amp stage. All the other revisions use a bipolar transistor. The gain reduction FET in this model is also different from other revisions, most notably lacking a source resistor. This results in a little more distortion, which defines the blue stripe sound. The Rev D is considered the most classic FET compressor sound and what most 1176 hardware revisions and plugins are based on. The Hairball Rev D has the functionality of Rev B through Rev E units. These units use a bipolar transistor as the first active component and introduced low noise circuitry. The Rev F is cleaner than the A or the D. In addition to your classic FET compressor sound, you also get a more glossy, polished effect on your source material. The 1176 is a straightforward compressor with simple controls. A FET compressor utilizes a field effect transistor at its heart. FET compressors are fast acting while doing an excellent job at preserving transients. Transients are the initial peak or spike of a sound. Think about the initial impact of a snare drum hit. With that said, let's take a look at the controls. The controls on an 1176 are standard across all revisions. Starting with the front of the unit, let's take a look at the input. The input sets the level of the signal being sent into the unit. The input acts as a threshold control. Higher levels here will result in more compression. The output adjusts the level of the signal leaving the 1176. Increasing this will make up any gain lost due to gain reduction. Attack determines how quickly the compressor will respond to an incoming signal and begin gain reduction. All the options on the Rev A are considered extremely fast and range from 10 to 800 microseconds. All the way to the left disables compression, but still allows your signal to pass through the unit. Some folks do this to give their signal a little bit of color. 
Release is how long it takes for the unit to return to its initial or pre-gain level. Release time can be adjusted from 50 to 110 milliseconds. If release is too fast, you may get a pumping or breathing sound which is undesirable in most applications. If release is too slow, gain reduction may wind up being applied to softer sections of sound making it more difficult to hear. It should be noted that the attack and release times on an 1176 get faster as you turn the knob clockwise. Think of it a little bit like a speedometer. More is faster. Now let's take a look at the push buttons. Ratio is how intense the gain reduction is when the signal passes the threshold level. A 4 to 1 ratio means that for every 4 decibels increase in the loudness of the input signal, there is only a decibel increase in the output signal. Same goes for 8 to 1. For every 8 decibels increase in the input signal, there is only 1 decibel increase in the output signal. 12 to 1 is considered mild limiting, and 20 to 1 is hard limiting. There's a fun little feature hidden in the ratio buttons. All buttons mode, otherwise known as British mode, is when you select all ratio buttons at once. Some button master figured out doing this resulted in a compression mode somewhere between 12 to 1 and 20 to 1. This results in a more overdriven compression tone with varied attack and release times. All buttons mode is completely safe. Just ignore the meter maxing out. The meter can display the amount of gain reduction or output level. GR shows the amount of gain reduction. In plus 8 mode, a meter readout of 0 means plus 8 decibel milliwatts at the output. At plus 4, you get plus 4 decibel milliwatts at the output. The off button turns the compressor on and off. There is no bypass option on the 1176. There's also a gain reduction zero adjust on the front panel, which is used to set the meter tracking. You would use this to make sure that the meter shows minus 10 decibels when the compressor is compressing 10 decibels. Moving over to the back, we'll start with the passive link. This uses an RCA jack to provide stereo linking between two 1176 units. Passive linking requires an RCA battery powered stereo adapter. This method links the control voltages after the sidechain, causing attack times to be doubled. The input and output XLR jacks are how the signal goes to and from the unit. They expect a line level signal. Stereo link is an additional component you can purchase with the 1176, which allows you to link two units using a TRS quarter inch cable. Active link sums the audio from both units before the sidechain and does not impact attack time. This method eliminates the need for supermatched FETs or an external calibration box. The off on button activates or deactivates the stereo link. When using the stereo link, you'll activate send on one unit and receive on the other. For the record, I played around with a lot of different settings before settling on the ones that I liked. It's really important that you experiment. There are no presets, and it's all about what sounds good. Let's compress some vocals first. My buddy Jesse from the Imperial Imposters is singing on this one. I'm using the compressor to fatten things up a little bit and to add a little bit of grit. Before compressing, I've gone through and automated the volume on the track to make sure that I'm feeding the compressor a nice even signal. For the snare drum, we're going to try some parallel compression. This is also known as crushing. I'm going to send the snare drum to two faders. On the first one, you'll have an unaffected snare drum sound. On the second one, you're going to have the 1176 compressing the snare drum. I'll blend in that second fader to taste. By doing this, I get a nice punchy and sustained snare hit. 
The unaffected track is going to preserve my transient, and the compressed track is going to pull up the sustain. I'm going to go ahead and use all buttons mode on this one to give it a little extra character, and I'm going to set my attack and release at the maximum. For the base, I'm going to use an 8 to 1 ratio. I'll use a medium attack and a fast release. I actually have some EQ going before it's fed into the compressor in order to make sure that the bass and the kick drum play nice together. This bass track was recorded by Tiba. He's finger picking like a madman on this one. Hey, listen to me. There's a free download link to that song in the video description. Go get yourself a copy if you like it. Oh, and uh, by the way, if you're looking for a place to start with an 1176, try out the Dr. Pepper setting. There was an old Dr. Pepper ad that told you to drink a Dr. Pepper at 10, 2, and 4. Instead of getting diabetes, you can use these numbers as a starting point to set up your 1176. Set the attack to 10, the release to 2, and the ratio to 4 to 1, and adjust from there. I want to make a quick note about outboard gear. It's important to understand how you're going to connect your DAW to your outboard gear. You're going to need several line inputs and outputs in order to make this happen. It's also important that you have some sort of latency compensation in your DAW. You're going to be going from digital, the DAW, to analog, your outboard gear, and then back into the digital realm again. I actually ended up switching from Pro Tools to Studio One because of my outboard gear. I couldn't find an easy way to use outboard gear and compensate for latency in my workflow with Pro Tools. Studio One makes things super easy with the Pipeline XT plugin. Like everything related to Pro Tools, I'm sure it can be done if you're a power user, but I'm not one. My entire workflow and not just my outboard gear experience has been easier since I switched over to Studio One. I haven't looked back. Let's talk about the build. The documentation from Hairball is top tier. You'll have no problems understanding what goes where and what to do next. I was considering making a calibration video, but the full picture guide provided by Hairball does an excellent job of walking you through the process. Instead, I'm gonna walk you through a few interesting parts and pieces of my build. Here is the C38371 input transformer which is a recreation of the UTC-012 transformers used in the Rev A through F. The EA-5002 output transformer is a faithful reproduction of the output transformer used in early Rev A through E FET compressor models. There's a Zener diode which is threaded through the power section of the board, which is something I hadn't seen before. Zener diodes are pretty cool. They're a special type of diode designed to reliably allow current to flow backwards when a certain set reverse voltage is reached. The optional active stereo link we discussed earlier is located here. The meter buttons are located here. When I tightened down both screws for the meter buttons, I found that they would get stuck. I had to back off each of the screws just a bit to find a spot where they would properly release when a new button was pressed. The tolerance on this slot must be pretty tight. Even with the screws backed off, the buttons still sit in the slot nicely and don't wobble around. This didn't happen with the ratio buttons. There's a real satisfaction to building your own rack gear. 
I haven't felt this sense of pride since the sixth grade when I learned how to tie my own shoes. It just feels good to know that I can build something that sounds so damn good. It's really nice to work with something that doesn't live in a computer screen. I find that physically interacting with the controls allows me to more readily and deeply understand the equipment. Another massive perk to building your own gear is that you'll be able to service or fix it in the event that you need to down the line. On the flip side, plugins do sound pretty damn good these days and physical storage space is at a premium for most people. You're gonna have to weigh all these considerations when you decide if the 1176 is for you. That said, I absolutely recommend the Hairball 1176. Hairball provides a complete and high-end experience from beginning to end. The unit sounds amazing and performs exactly like I anticipated. This build will serve as both a confidence builder and a launch point for your DIY rack gear obsession. And when I say obsession, I don't say it lightly. Once you realize you can build stuff like this, you're not gonna wanna stop. I'm looking forward to building a pair of Rev Ds in the not too distant future. You know, Sloppy Sock, you're a pretty cool guy. You should stop by and help me with another video sometime. I hope you're not just the result of me abusing inhalants.